Hello, and thank you for joining me for this episode of Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and today I'm going to be taking a look at a game between Nana Zygnidzi and Alexander Kosteniuk from the 2020 Cairns Cup. Uh, this was a game uh, played very well by Alexandra, actually, and we're going to see some endgame technique in this one. A lot to look forward to here. So let's just jump into it, see what we've got. The game started d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and we see bishop e4, a Nimzo Indian for you guys. And there are many, many ways to play against the Nimzo Indian. For example, e3, queen c2, simply knight f3, even f3, even bishop g5, even g3. These are all available options. So of course, Nana does none of those and plays bishop d2, everybody's favorite move. And this idea is kind of similar to some queen c2 ideas. You simply want to recapture this knight, not with the pawn, but instead with the bishop. This is the idea of white's opening. Uh, so instead uh, of taking, of course, black just castles, we now see knight f3. Black continues with b6. Getting developed, we see e3, c5, challenging white's center. And now after a3, the bishop does take, and the bishop does recapture. And once again, now that this knight is out of the way, white's control over the light squares is a little bit weakened, so black takes this opportunity to bring the knight to the nice central square on e4. White continues with rook c1. We now see bishop b7 using the long diagonal. And after bishop b2, black doesn't really want to play d5, blocking in his own bishop, or her own bishop in this case. So instead, she plays d6, controlling some dark squares and allowing this bishop to breathe. White now castles and we see knight takes c3 from white, uh, uh, from black rather. Uh, this move, of course, just aiming to eliminate the bishop pair be before it becomes a problem. And this is probably why this bishop d2 line isn't really all that common from the white player. Black can simply play like this, eliminate the problem of the bishop pair, and then black should be doing just fine. Uh, white recaptures with the rook. We now see queen e7 uh, getting this queen off of this soon to be open d file and uh, supporting some more of these pawns. White now expands further on the queen side with the move b4. Black finishes development with knight d7. We now see knight d2, preparing to bring this knight over to some queen side squares. Uh, we see a5 from black, aiming at this b4 square, challenging white's uh, expansion on the queen side, and perhaps daring her even to play this move b5 when, with the, the closing of the queen side, black would be much more free to play on the center and also play on the king side even, depending on how ambitious she's uh, feeling that day. So of course, instead of b5, white plays a better move, bishop f3, which is actually a pawn sacrifice. Uh, and we do see black go for, go for the pawn here, with a takes b4, a takes b4, c takes b4. Note that this rook's under, under pressure, so you don't really have time to take on b7. Although this would be playable for uh, for white going in for an end, end, going in for an end game like this. Instead, though, we simply see rook b3, and now uh, perhaps best for black was to eliminate these bishops before shutting off this diagonal. But she did it in the other order, simply playing d5, keeping the bishops on the board. Now we see c takes d5, and actually after bishop takes d5, the bishops come off anyways. But instead of having uh, this pawn on e6, this, this pawn comes out to d5 now. Um, in this position, white plays rook b2. Black gets a little bit more active with rook a3. And now we see queen e2 and f5 from black. And this move's a little bit of a mistake. It's, it's a little bit uh, overpressing uh, is the term I would like to use. Uh, it's creating a lot of weaknesses, specifically on this diagonal and on this 7th rank all in an effort to play f4 and take on e3. And here it's, it's simply a little bit too slow. For example, after the move queen b5, which is played in the game, uh, already there's too many threats in the center for you to keep this rook on this nice active outpost. You have to come back to a5. Now this queen kind of worms its way into black's position. Uh, black does achieve f4, but it doesn't really come with the devastating effect that uh, one could hope for. White simply takes this pawn off the board, and after rook takes f4, the fact is, your king has really been severely weakened by the absence of this f-pawn. Uh, white continues with knight b3. Black plays rook a3, giving up this pawn on d5. In return, after queen f7, queen d6, 
Uh, note that this uh, knight is kind of hanging, but if you take it, this knight on d7 falls as well, as well as actually this rook on f4. Got to be really careful of these things. So instead, we simply see rook a4 from uh, black, rook e1 from white, a natural move, preparing to activate this rook. Uh, we see rook f6, trying to evict this queen from its active post on d6. Queen comes into c7, but now knight f8. And black has undone most of the damage that, that she did to her position here. Uh, with the pawn on f7, she had good chances to kind of uh, even press for more. With the f pawn gone, she's using her pieces to kind of cover these holes in her position, which is just fine. So white takes this opportunity to finally trade the queens, realizing that the black king has found safety. So we see king takes f7 uh, after queen f7. And now after knight d2, this rook comes to d6, trying to pick up this d pawn. Knight f3 and knight e6 adds even more pressure. Rook d1 is actually white's uh, mistake here, uh, because tactically this does not even defend the d pawn. Much better is rook c1 eyeing uh, some squares on the c file, trying to gain activity in exchange for this d pawn. Instead, after rook d1, Black can simply capture this. Uh, it, it's as simple as that. There's nothing left to calculate. You can't take this because after rook takes, there is problem uh, on there is a problem on your back rank here that cannot be dealt with. Uh, so after knight takes d4, there's also no funny business with rook d2. You're gonna get hit with knight takes f3 check, and this would also be a, a horribly losing endgame. So after knight d4, now white simply plays king f1, but now knight b5 and black has comf comfortably regained this d pawn and is up a pawn in this endgame. We see rook uh, d to b1, trying to take this guy, but after knight c3, rook b4, rook b4, rook b4, we see rook d1 check, knight e1, black defends this pawn with b5, and this is just slightly uncomfortable for the white player here. This b pawn is pretty far advanced actually on the fifth rank, and it's starting to create some, some annoying threats of becoming a queen in the future. And in the meantime, this knight is really stuck here on the e1 square. Uh, perhaps best for white was to try to get out of this by playing f3 and king f2, but rather than that, she actually chose g3. This move doesn't immediately solve her problems. It allows black to bring her king, uh, sorry, I messed up a bit. First rook b3, rook c1, then she plays this move g3, but this does allow the black king to get back into the game just a bit with king e6. And after king g2, this was white's idea, but the problem is the trade of the knights is actually beneficial for black here. In this rook end game, black is very much going to be pressing, despite it being quote unquote three pawns versus three pawns in a rook end game. The fact that this b pawn is passed and already so far advanced with this king so far into the action means that uh, Kasteniuk has very good chances to win this game. She starts with king d6, bringing the king closer to the pawn. This rook comes to c8, trying to get behind the passed pawn, a reasonable idea. But now after rook e7, black is doing a nice job of controlling her 7th rank. Rook b8, king c5, and this pawn is, is actually going to go all the way to victory here. Uh, f4 is on the board, but now b4, king f3, this king simply walks the pawn up the board, rook c8, rook d8, and eventually rook c8, king b2. But now f5, b3, white is simply far too slow on the king's side to deal with this passed pawn. And now a very, very nice move here from white actually, or from black actually, is the move rook a7. This move, of course, granting this king asylum on the A file from any checks so the king can safely get out of the way of the pawn and allow it to promote. G5 on the board, simply king A2, king E4, and now B2 and B1 is making a queen. Uh, white sacrifices her rook for the pawn, hoping to use her own king to uh, uh, force black to sacrifice her rook in exchange, mm -hmm. but it's simply far too slow. F6 is played, and actually G6 is black's choice. All, all moves are really winning here. You can take, you can play G6, or you can ignore it. Everything is fine for black. But we do see G6, and after king E5, rook A5 check. And black's point is that she's picking up this G pawn, and while white is successful in forcing um, 
let's see, forcing black to give up the uh, give up the rook here with king e7. Unfortunately, the king and pawn endgame is just dead lost after g5. Uh, the game did get played out to its full conclusion here, but it turns out, as Nana I'm sure calculated accurately, uh, white is just a few tempi too slow, and after queen g5, uh, Alexander, or Nana, uh, I'm sorry, Nana actually did resign here. Of course, Alexandra calculating it out very well. Uh, of course, if the king steps to h8, it's the only legal move, and black is going to pick up this pawn. Uh, so a very nicely played game by Alexander Kostenyuk, showing some uh, technique in that rook endgame. Despite material being even, once again, we see the power of the outside passed pawn. Uh, being able to promote with the help of the king, and Alexandra managed to take down her opponent in this game. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Game Review. My name is Caleb Dunby, and I will see you next time.